somebody say cheese. You on video, you don't need to say cheese. Clock. There you go. Y'all bread, the chop bitch two miles that way. <laughs> that way everybody back home knows everybody. <laughs> Get out of here. Well, I tell you what, ball up power by tomorrow. Woo! Hey, I'm missing out on. Try to do a little bit of Perkins. Hey, get the home being the same spot. Are you videoing right now? Yeah, the home being the same spot. Hey, wish you Alright, recording. Yeah, that'll probably work. Don't worry about that. No, it's the constant joke. It's weird. I, I know what I want to talk about. I know what I want to say. I just, I don't know how to start. This is going to be tough. I guess I just start at the beginning. We are intelligent misfits. We just are moral blind. It was just, <laughs> it was just enough. The BSTB kind of was the island of misfit toys. Yeah. After high school, I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. Never really felt like I fit in here too well. It was a different culture, different type of people, everything else all the way around. Grew up here. We're in Somerset, PA. Farming, and when I, after the farm, joined the Army, and I was into building things, and a combat engineer was going to build things. I grew up in Illinois, and originally from Elmhurst, the Chicago West suburb. I moved downstate to a little town called Girard. I was in the Army for eight years active duty. I joined in 2001 and got out in 2009. I stayed with ROTC and commissioned with them and got um, branch military intelligence. Had family that was in the military and that was probably the main reason why I ended up joining the the army. So I was homeschooled uh, in throughout high school. I went I did go to public school. I started being homeschooled around seventh grade. Following that being homeschooled I did one semester of community college. I did okay uh, but it just really wasn't where I wanted to be. I was uh, in the military from 2004 to 2009. I uh, joined full-time army. Part of 410 the whole time same unit the whole time. Average student at best. Got too much into uh, having fun, so school kind of came uh, second after that. Afterwards is basically just a series of just kind of jobs to help me pay for hanging out with my friends and partying. And my dad said, how about the service academies? And so I put down uh, U.S. Military Academy and U.S. Naval Academy. Took the tests, didn't really think about it. I joined the Army when I was 18, I went to basic training in Fort Leonard Wood. I met a recruiter one time kind of by accident and I was, and I was just kind of bored in my small town and I didn't really know what I wanted to do next, that I want to go to college. Your branch preference is listed out back then, it was one through 16. It's done by your academic standing. Engineers happen to be my 11th choice. And then I met an army recruiter just to check and he happened to be an MP. And he told me all the fun things I was gonna do and the places that I would go. None of which I went to any of those places. My, my options were MP, infantry, and chemical. And the recruiter did a good job of selling this MOS to me because he showed me soldiers working in a lab with chemicals mixing. So I was like, oh snap, I wanna do that. My first duty station as an MP was Fort Knox. So it was garrison, it was law enforcement. Went to the MP desk for what was supposed to be 12 months, turned into 20 months. I was a heavy equipment operator and uh, I had done some of that on the civilian side. So I thought that'd be something easy to drop into. At the time when I joined, I was one of those kids who was either gonna end up doing a lot of stupid things or joining the military. Arguably another stupid thing. They pitched me on being a combat engineer because that's what he was. He's like, dude, this is going to be the best job ever. He showed me the video of Sapper School. He's like, you get to go blow stuff up. You're like the infantry, but you get explosives. I'm like, heck yeah. Partially, I didn't know what I was getting into. To be fair, I was sold by my recruiter that I was joining as a healthcare specialist. 
uh, and I didn't find out I was a combat he got medic you with that. until I joined, until I was at AIT, and I see all of these signs, like combat medic, combat medic, and I go up to a drill sergeant. I see all these signs for the combat medics, but I'm looking for the healthcare specialist. Like, where do the healthcare specialists go? And then they all laugh at me for not knowing I was a combat medic until that uh, exact moment. My job, I was called, a, I was a chaplain assistant, a 56 mic. People don't really know what it is. People say assistant chaplain, assistant to the chaplain. Assistant to the regional manager. Exactly, assistant <laughs> to the regional manager. We went to AIT, they walked us into this room. They had a bunch of big boxes with the little tire chips in it and this metal silver disc just sitting in there. Congratulations, you're a combat engineer. Your job is to find and defuse landmines. Like what? I found myself laying on my face probing for mines. I thought I was going to be constructing buildings. <laughs> Went through basic and AIT uh, down at Fort Leonard Wood. I think it was like January 2nd. I ended up getting to Polk. I say, uh, it's, they're sending me to 10th Mountain. He started laughing again. <laughs> I'm like, bro, why? And he said, yeah, man, rapid deployment. You're going to 4th Brigade and Fort Polk. And I'm like, what's that, Fort Polk, Louisiana? Nothing. At that time, we didn't have smartphones, none of that. And I'm running the PX. Run of the PA. Hey, Google uh, <laughs> internet search. What was the nickname for Fort Polk that you heard the most? I feel like Armpit of the Army was like the main one though. Well, one second ACR kind of went away. Some of us stayed. Some of us went to that other company and then everybody else just kind of scattered. Slowly but surely people started leaving and then you notice kind of like, hey, I'm still here. Then he's leaving, he's leaving, I'm still here. And then they were like, uh, hey, uh, go up the street and report over there. And that was it. So I re-enlisted at some point when I was in Korea. And then uh, the winter of that year, 04, uh, I left Korea. Um, and yeah, they sent me back to Fort Polk. And we were just standing up, so like 10th Mountain didn't really exist yet. Technically it didn't. You know, the, like the people were there. I remember they kind of read out where all of our orders were and they just kind of kept saying, Fort Polk, Fort Polk, Fort Polk, Fort Polk. We had to ask, where's Fort Polk? We had no idea. I went straight into Sapper School, did that. Went straight uh, from Sapper School to Airborne School. And then it was all new people, like fresh out of AIT. You re-enlisted, you went, you did Iraq. How was that? Like I was in Fallujah for Phantom Fury, and Fallujah was bad. We lost our sergeant major, a company commander, an alpha company commander, an alpha company's exo in 12 hours. And so did you PCS to Polk? And then I PCS to Polk. That was where I found myself in January 2005, joining the 4th Brigade of the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division, the most deployed division in the U.S. Army. What do you think was the average age of the battalion? Ooh, that's a good question. 20, 22, 23? I mean, that's what I would guess it as. Yeah. I was, I turned 24 in Iraq okay. and I was older than a lot of the guys. I think I would have been 27 or 28 at the time. So I was, I was old. You know, there was a, a great need. No idea what a Brigade Special Troops Battalion was. The Brigade Special Troops Battalion consisted of a lot of I guess they're called support companies. HHC was a military police platoon. A lot of the 10th Mountain guys that were coming in, basically brand new to the Army. Some of them had prior duty stations, but not many. The medical section, which is where I went because I was a combat medic. Mechanics, chemical biological warfare. Alpha Company needed an NBC and CO. That's where I went. So I did a long thing with Alpha Company. Alpha Company, BSTB which was the engineers, and then I was second platoon. First and second were the combat engineers. And combat engineers has three jobs, mobility, counter-mobility, survivability. If someone needs to get somewhere, it's our job to clear a path for them. Counter-mobility, if someone, we're there to make sure no one can get to you. We put up landmines, obstacles, anything we can do to keep them from getting to everyone else and then help build up FOB security and stuff like that. That's basically the life of a combat engineer. And then there was a third platoon, which was called a &O. Assault and obstacle a &O platoons, kind of the eyeballs. We had a few pieces of equipment, the five ton, the deuce, sea trucks. The sea trucks were always funny. They're funny, yes. I have a picture somewhere of Baldwin with one that is just absolutely buried up to the axles. 
And Bravo Company was military intelligence. Especially with the intel, they tried to get us, because we were all pretty much all source analysts, so they tried to get us. In. Do you want me to hold you? <laughs> <laughs> so they tried to get us into as many positions, you know, just to switch us around. And Charlie Company was a communications company, so they handled all long-range communications, internet, satellite, all that stuff. It was certainly kind of a mess at first because they were trying to put all these pieces together. I remember they just stuck us in some random barracks, you know, for a little bit until we eventually got ones. When we got there, 410 didn't exist. So it was a whole weird shit show. They're like, oh, that technically means second ACR. Sergeant Anderson, our platoon sergeant at that point, I remember him always saying he enjoyed having all of us. They were able to train us and have us exactly how they wanted. I, we, I mean, we hit the, the ground running. I mean, I, I had to, otherwise I was gonna fall on my face. High out tempo, we trained hard. A lot of the guys played pretty yeah, hard too. Fun, yeah. <laughs> Half the reason we knew the engineers is because we were either getting in fights with them or working with them. You're drinking with them sometimes. Yeah, generally all three in the same night. <laughs> I just remember training, I mean, all the time. That's that's all I remember is going to the motor pool, you know, going to ranges and range. I just remember the, I mean, the heat and the humidity did help climatize us. I feel yes, that, we were I ready mean, for the heat. Yeah, the heat. I mean, it was always hot, but it did not kill us. Uh, and that's all we did is like, oh, hey, you're you're in a brigade combat team. You're only going to deploy. And so they just train to deploy, train to deploy. And that's pretty much we lived in the box in the field. Definitely a lot of hard times that all the training that they put us through got us through. The simple fact that we always knew how to react to things. I mean, I remember some of the NCOs, they, they definitely had some bitches and gripes. We were always in the field. If we had an open four days, we were going out to the field. And the best way to, to learn those jobs is to go out in the field and do it. And we were in the field a lot. Yeah, I mean, when we weren't staying out in the field for a training exercise, yeah. seven o'clock, we're rolling out the gate and out to the training area. We trained from eight until nine or 10 o'clock at night. Oh, we did so much night fire. You know, train as you fight. I think in total, I went through six or seven JRTC rotations, whether it was with our unit or attached to other units. I think we were an outstanding model for other units to emulate. One of the effects of that is that we all got to know each other really, really well. By the time we started doing deployments, we all knew each other. We saw each other every day. We saw each other most days when we weren't working. We were all just there. We didn't understand how good we had it. <laughs> we really didn't. It was March 2006 is when we went to Afghanistan. January 05 to March 06, all we did was train. So we had kind of an unusual situation where we didn't deploy as a brigade. I was still the, the training NCO and uh, the whole MP platoon was going three weeks before the, the deployment. Tag, you're it, you're going too. So the way that we were set up, first platoon supported 2-4 infantry, and then 2nd platoon mine supported 230 infantry. 1st platoon was already attached to them, so we tagged along. So when we knew that 2-4 was getting the call to deploy, I was being moved to the executive officer position for Alpha Company. We were chosen as the kind of company headquarters for the BSTB, so the, the MP platoon, they came under us. First platoon of Alpha Company, some elements of a &O, some elements of, of HHC. A bunch of folks that, from different companies, and trying, again, once again, you know, you get, a, you're already on the island of misfit toys, and then you create, you know, you pick some out of each, each group, and then you do it all over again, uh, this time to get ready to go to combat. And we deployed on March 9th. The okay. day before my anniversary. We all flew out together. Do you remember flying out to Wolverine? Got in the, the helicopters. They took us to the different places. They dropped me off at Wolverine, and I looked around, and it was, you know, incredibly austere. While in Kandahar, before going out to our, you know, Wolverine to our final spot, uh, destination, I twisted my ankle. So for two weeks, I couldn't, I couldn't move. I got there way after you guys did, like a week and a half after you guys did. So what was the elevation, like 4,000 feet? It was in the mountains. Improvised everything. For the first two weeks, we didn't have power. How big was the base? I don't know, maybe an acre total? Yeah, about that. Sco basket perimeter, makeshift guard tower. Yeah, one bunker. The tents that slept 15. They all had like little plywood rooms built into them. 
I slept on a cot for eight months. Yeah, <laughs> yep, the cots. It was 173rd, wasn't it, that we replaced? I think so. I think and they were just over it. Yeah, they, they had hit their fuck it level. My main job was, I was the commander's gunner. So I want to say almost on a daily basis we were going out. If I wasn't out on a mission with, with the CO, I was in the talk. Yeah, so it was called the, the Dob Pass. The Afghan trucks, as it stood, could not traverse over the pass. We had Captain Douglas, who was an actual engineer, but his idea, well, the f there were two ideas. One of them was to drop a JDAM on the top of the mountain, yeah. just bomb it and yeah, see yeah, if we could yeah, flatten yeah. it out. The option that we went with was uh, we hired some Pakistani construction crews. These guys would set up drills and go down five or six feet into the stone. And then we stuck Bangalore's long tubes of explosives, conventionally meant to like lay over an enemy obstacle such as barbed wire or whatever, and then just blow a hole. After days and days of drilling, we would set up these, these big ass pipe bombs in each of the holes, chain them all together, make sure everybody was clear, and just <laughs> blow up the top six feet of the mountain pass. Yeah. I remember the first one we did because we had no idea if it was gonna work or not. And so we set one up as like, I think three, and it wrecked the pass for like three days because we had to get a bulldozer and to clear all the rock out that we had thrown up in the air. <laughs> And we're like, oh, okay, this is gonna work. Yeah, so we were going up there for months, drilling holes, working with local nationals, dropping Bangalores. We are being overran. I was at Wolverine with yeah. the majority of them, and I don't know where the rest of the guys we went. We split a couple of guys off for that FOB Lane project. The bridge thing by the Special Forces yeah. FOB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I did a recon one, with that. But... That was a crazy base. That was, yes. that was a dangerous spot. Well, and that was the one where they damn near flooded the Humvees, because there was yeah. no way in there like a lot of the year because of how much water was on that road. I, I got switched to being the commander's driver for that mission because they kept getting stuck. Did you guys get to do much equipment operation during no. that? No. There was a tiny little bit when you first started out there, just kind of like reconning it, fixing some culverts. You know, the living conditions sucked. The The mission was actually kind of nice just because we were actually doing stuff. Yeah, we had, a, we had a routine. At some point we actually did the rotation to where one, one squad stayed to do security on... It was every other day. Yeah, You'd go day. out every other day. It's just an absolute foreign landscape to here. You can see forever, and it's just sand dune, mountain, foothill, and another one, and another one, and another one. I thought it was gorgeous. It was so cool. And I remember sitting up on the OPs in Dodd Pass, and you could look down over the valley, and you just could count all the dust devils. Who was the first cook out there? He was the reason we all got sick really uh, bad. Somebody, it might have been Turley, had to pull me aside at one point was like, are you eating? Cause I, I hit like 150 pounds or something. Oh, all of us did, like... We were skinny. I was in the med station for dysentery. This is gross. I just remember I was supposed to go to guard. I just stood up to get ready to go to guard duty. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh. And just shit all over the floor. Oh dude, you weren't the only one. And I was just like, I can't do this. And then I went to the aid station and puked two or three times on the way there. And then there was like, a and A guy sitting there with his foot blown off. <laughs> I, I kind of felt bad about it because like, well, I'm, here I am throwing up, and this guy doesn't have a foot. We went to go check out something in the middle of the night, and that's when it hit me. I'm up on the gun turret, and I would just. I'll, at some point, we were like, "Nah, forget it. I'll just eat an MRE." Well, and Scott fired him at some point because yeah. we literally just like threw him in the Humvee and drove him back to to Logman, and we're like, "Give us someone else." And after that, the food actually became edible. Oh man, the biggest one would be Father's Day. I was coming back from, from the defect from Chow Hall. I was on my way back to my tent. I was in the, uh, what do you call it, the MWR tent. Yeah, I was in the MWR tent talking to my dad because it was Father's Day. Perkins and I were walking and we heard the first one hit 
And we kind of stopped and we're looking at each other like, did you hear that? What the hell was that? I just remember I was in the NWR tent and I had sprinted from the NWR tent to the um, to go grab my gear to get on the truck. I had Holloway, just Mr. Fit, just trying to run and I'm just booking it past them to get to my stuff. Did we have a siren? No, we had that stupid bullhorn that they would play the alarm sound on. One of the rockets came in and hit right on the wall. Off to the corner, on this, off, off the side of the corner of my eye, I remember just seeing it first. You didn't hear it, you, you saw it. Bright explosion, and then everybody just running everywhere. That's right, I forgot the initiative, because we took some direct fire, I thought, at that point. Oh yeah, there was green tracers. There was everything flying overhead, brother. I remember tracers, I remember explosions. One or two that hit ours, and then everything else either went over, or it hit the ANA compound right next to us, or right behind us. Grabbed my aid bag, grabbed my IBA and stuff, and I ran over by the wall. Whoever was next to me, I'm like, don't tell my family you saw me do this, and I just grabbed my aid bag and ran for it. We were getting ready to roll out to go try to find the people, and their Sergeant Mars was like, hey, go grab one of the medics, we can't leave without a medic. I just opened the door, see y'all, like, oh, y'all are busy, and just shut the door and left. Yeah, we had three patients. <laughs> well, and there was only three medics on that entire yeah, base. Was, you went more in the sergeant that was the there. The 230, or 2-4 guy was Dupree, I believe. And then I got back to him, he's like, where's the medic? Like, oh, they're busy. One of the first mortars that came in hit like the edge of one of their tents. And oh. so it fragged like three of their guys. None of, none of them were hurt really all that bad, but yeah, we ended up having to babysit that guy all night. Do you remember when they direct laid the 105 round right over the base? Because they had that one artillery piece yeah. that the ANA had. Yeah. And I mean, that round had to have passed directly over our heads. Because yeah. I just remember feeling the tent like balloon out from the overpressure. We had one of the patients on a litter sitting on the ground of the tent yeah. and I just dove on him. And then the ANA interpreter's in there with us and he starts yelling at me like, no, 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 us, us. And then what else? I mean, shit, everything. A lot, of, a lot happened at Wolverine. A lot of IEDs. We were doing good about not hitting them though. Yeah, we were finding most of them. We found a bunch. We definitely parked a vehicle on top of at least one or two of them. The truck I was in was hit by a suicide bomber. Actually, was that my truck? Is this the one where when you guys came back, um, you, you could still find a piece of the guy's finger on the grill? Oh yeah, dude, we found bits of him all over the place. Right, yeah, yeah, I remember that. I, I don't know why I didn't go, but I was supposed to go on that mission. I think Meadows was in the turret. I think Meadows, it was one of, the, one of you tall guys, because I literally had to punch him in the leg and be like, are you okay? because we're all deaf. And he's oh, yeah. so far out of the turret, I couldn't look up and make sure that he was okay. <laughs> yeah, now that smelled like iron, right? Oh yeah, well and everything else. Just that whole route to Dot Pass, we could have gotten fucked up all the time. Well, and we were doing it twice a day. It was so like, predictable. Yeah. We, they could have... We got... tried to mix up like our departure times and stuff, but there's only so much you can do. Right, right yeah. They could have gotten us there. So I remember a couple things. One, I remember I don't know, but he had a bunch of people in the back. He crashed and, I mean, it was like a full all hands on deck yeah. for, for these guys. I think there was 11 people on that truck. I think yeah. I've seen the pictures of that. Yeah, you and I basically, you got tasked to me because I was treating a guy mm -hmm. with a uh, femur fracture. Because the other two was dealing with a guy who had an open skull fracture. And then I think it was the next day when the guy blew his foot off. What was what, what happened to the the A and A guy that came, that with the, his leg blowing up and do you he guys... stepped on a landmine. I mean, we spent all of our time treating their guys. We we didn't treat a whole lot of our guys in the aid station. That, well, that was a good thing, though. I mean, yeah. The other rollover we had was one of the local nationals who was we were escorting was driving too slow. They thought, so they put Dorba in the truck to drive it. He was driving a, a flatbed semi loaded up with a, a dozer on the back, super top heavy. He rolled the truck over and the dozer stayed tied to the trailer. <laughs> well, you know what we ended up doing? No. Somebody had to come out with the crane. They got it flipped back over and realized they couldn't drive the truck or the trailer because the brakes were locked up. We hooked the dozer up to the front of the semi and it towed the semi back to the base. The it back. dragged it. <laughs> We got back in at like three o'clock in the morning. That was, <laughs> that was just one of the things. Just comedy. So Tim and I were the one on top of Afghanistan on that hill where we had to medical tape the 
cratering charge because we didn't have any uh, 100 mile an hour tape. <laughs> Hey, it'll hold it for it'll, I mean, it'll work for the purposes I mean, we need. I remember work. asking him, I'm like, does it actually matter? Like, it just needs to hold the C4 in place, right? He's like, yeah. I'm like, here. I just handed him my medical tape. <laughs> Setting the charge up to put the, the blasting cap in it. And he was working on something else with it. We just kind of looked at each other and was like, dude, we just built an IED. <laughs> so many situations like that in Afghanistan. You just. Remember the dogs? Yeah. That was a divisive subject. <laughs> Yes, I liked them, but it was also one of those things of they liked the Americans. Early on, we brought a puppy back from Kualat. That's what it was. That's the one we kept in our tent. Because he rode back to Wolverine in my lap. Like, ah, that's right. I forgot from... that you had him. Yeah, but I remember I got surgical gloves from you, and we filled surgical gloves with milk and yeah. rice or whatever. We ended up giving that thing like protein powder and shit, because that's all we had. And that thing was stout. Like that thing was a freaking mean football. We needed we needed a hobby. We needed something to. It was keep, great. Yeah, it was fantastic. We had that one time where we did the foot patrol out to uh, do the BDA. Yeah, because we dropped that bomb on the mortar team. Oh yeah, I, was, I remember that. That was fun walking through the wadis and everything. Do you remember the like four of us that fell off the because we couldn't see the the ravine? Oh yeah. <laughs> I was. I think it was number two of that group. I fell down. And then, down. like, the two people behind me followed me off the damn thing. No one did not fall down that night. Everyone. Pretty much. Everyone was on their butt at least twice that entire night. I remember hitting a wadi and just sliding down the side of my 240 and just being on the bottom, just like, oh, I'm just, I'm just done right now. That first five months, I was first squad, Rans Bottom was second squad, Bryant was third squad. First and second squads would, uh, trade back and forth between QRF for, we mostly went along Highway 1 through all of Zabo province. And the other squad would push out for three to four weeks and do basically a, a mobile training team, mobile police academy for district police. And then uh, second squad did the one that was the, the border police training way, way down. Way the yeah, hell out there, yeah. Yeah, by the, uh, the Pakistani border. We'd been training for a year, year and a uh, year and change. But when we hit the ground, things we all kind of like separated up. Where I was at, we were separate from our entire platoon. So Sergeant Bryant squad, we were third squad. We started out at Lagman, and then we ended up getting pushed down to from Fob Lagman to Spin Bulldog. We got attached to basically it was 101st headquarters. And then there was a National Guard, North Dakota National Guard, I want to say. The that Vigilant was... Archer guys. Yep, Vigilant Archer, yeah. I don't actually know what their unit was, but I just remember the stupid Dude, emblem they had. I have not had. heard that call sign in so long. The stupid that happened every time we ended up around those guys. Because Perrine got hurt when you guys were under them. We trained the Afghan police, you know, worked with the Afghan army. I mean, worked with the infantry. We'd create these little mini fobs just for a short period of time and stay there and train their people. And then we went way down south to a place called Atgar. We stayed out there with them for three weeks. That's the longest I've ever been without taking a shower. <laughs> uh, we were basically on top of a hill with... Was that when you guys all got mohawks? We shaved our heads completely. Oh, yeah, that's right. Everybody except for Diggy. While he was sleeping that night, Kiarte tried to shave his head and shaved like a spot in it. And like half of one eyebrow or some damn I, thing. Yeah, I think maybe an eyebrow to get clipped. That was it. And I mean, we just went to these little towns. I mean, it was MREs, bottled water, and that's all we had. I mean, there's one or two that I remember. We were gone forever and we had to come back just haggard. You know, we we're just skinny as can be. I mean, imagine eating MREs, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. My experience in Afghanistan compared to the guys in say, first squad and second squad, even my own guys in third squad, is very different because uh, the, the worst of the stuff that happened in Afghanistan happened when I wasn't there. That was something him and I never really talked about or hashed out, because I was actually his driver when he got hurt. And I, I, I remember it, we ended up going between two jingle trucks. What's a jingle truck? Uh, they, uh, do just a great job of, like, being gung-ho about their, their truck driving jobs, and they decorate them like, they put us to shame. Especially, I mean, some of those trucks have been in, like, families. Oh, and they fix them. Yeah. On the road, on like, the side of the road. it's their grandfather's yeah, truck. Yeah. 
And the jingle truck, I think, on the right, uh, his 50 barrel was canned off to the side of the truck, and it snagged his barrel and just basically ripped his finger open. It pinched him. Yeah, it was between the shield on the gun and the 50. Honestly, it was lucky it didn't take his whole damn hand off. Yeah. I mean, that was always a pester for him this whole time. Oh, it never got better. Yeah, no, I talked to him. He's a tough guy. I mean, I don't know how he put up with it. You can't really blame anybody because it's, it's so easy to see how it happened. Absolutely. I mean, it's like the fact that we didn't get into more vehicle accidents. I came out there for something. Was that the time where you had to yell at the dude? We were doing a range and he wasn't hitting paper from like 20 yards away. And the guy was telling you through the interpreter, like... That was at Shajoy. I learned quickly over there that, that uh, you know, inshallah, you know, if God wills it, means, no, I don't feel like doing that, and uh, I'm going to say something that uh, means you're not supposed to be able to call me lazy. I do not remember what I said to him. It's probably... I do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but my God wants me to use my fucking sights. <laughs> I don't know how the interpreter translated it. Most of them were, were pretty bad. And then we had the one guy that, that thought it'd be a great idea to just pull out his RPG. So the projectile went out about probably 30 yards and then just dropped almost straight down and exploded right by the, the ground. It was loud and thankfully we didn't get any uh, rock fragments. <laughs> one day the villagers just came in with a lamb and killed it right in front of us and threw it on open fire and we just pick at it. Everyone got sick except I didn't get sick that time, so. Not that time. Not that time. <laughs> like I remember the night that there was like 18 Afghani National Police stations went up in flames in one night because the Taliban went through and told every one of them on Highway 1, anyone who was found in those police stations was gonna get killed. And so in one night, uh, we were sitting up on this LPOP and um, we're just watching flames start coming up, like just popping up along this road. Uh, it was one of the more surreal experiences of my life because it's kind of quiet and there's, you know, like eight trucks up on top of this hill and we're all just sitting there going like, holy crap, while eating MREs. You know, uh, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. When they light the beacons. Yes, and it's just kind of like popping up. It was like that, only... Real? Only real? Yeah. And and police stations rather than beacons? Yeah, unfortunately, you kind of missed the fun part of that deployment. I, You know, I did. It's uh, still Afghanistan. It still thing. sucks, but... Well, it, it sucked, but it was also an adventure. My first, like, real experience with camels. Um, yeah. And they're, they're not okay. They're not no. an okay animal. Um, <laughs> they're, they seem very angry, and I think they need counseling. The first firefight I ever got in, gotten some intel that uh, that there was Taliban in the village, so. You were going to hit the village, right? Oh yeah, we couldn't roll the vehicles all the way into the village because there was this narrow bridge that had just enough width for the, the ANPs, an old Toyota Hilux. There was like eight of those dudes piled into it. Cormier was in the back seat. He told me to try to get the Afghan police to move their truck so that way we could pull the trucks and try to get some kind of security with our big guns. I can tell pretty quickly like this is very pointless, right? <laughs> so so I run back and tell Dean and uh, Diggy, let's go. Uh, me, Shep, um, Ben. How far in did you get before you guys started taking fire? Oh, right there. you were with the A&P. Yeah. Um, they ran up in front of us because they weren't wearing body armor. So there was uh, a big um, yard walled uh, around it, and they had, it was a grape orchard in there, and that's where um, most of the Taliban guys were. So we kind of started to do a little jog down there, and uh, here maybe three or four rounds go off, and literally just, I think my first thought was Afghan police just shooting off some rounds because occasionally that would happen. It wasn't necessarily, oh, you're being shot at just because you hear gunfire. You hear gunfire probably I mean, at least weekly. Five to 10 seconds later, another, you know, maybe even a slightly longer burst of fire. Um, and that's whenever I immediately just thought that we were definitely getting shot at. And that's whenever I then took off in more of a sprint and there were some berms to the right of me. So I went and jumped behind those. Diggy and Dean followed me. 
I, I could see the guys that were shooting at us. Ferguson, uh, Dean, Burks, and Diggy. Just like we trained with those initial live fire exercises, three to five second rushes going up the hill and they get up there and the, uh, the two guys there had taken off on a motorcycle. They saw blood splatter on the ground so they knew they hit the guys. And then we got information the next day. They found a couple of the bodies. Yeah, those two guys had been found down in, in the riverbed a couple miles away, bled out. I, they did have some RPGs. They definitely shot some RPGs at us. Um, I remember specifically one that kind of looked like it was, you know, going in our direction. I remember Dean telling me afterwards, like, man, like, that may have hit you if you didn't duck. <laughs> like, <laughs> I remember going into a, a room that had an open window to that courtyard and, uh, and I remember going in and getting out of the way of the, of the window, and right after I went past it, I remember hearing rounds impact, and then more rounds impacted right by the window. I know Shepard popped out and fired a couple shots and then back, and uh, I don't remember what he said, but he had a huge, you know, big cheesy grin on his face. And uh, we got a few more shots, and then I popped in there, and I saw a guy rolling over um, a dirt row. I remember popping him there, I hit him by his left hip and the round went around his spine and exited by his right hip. He went running down the row and I walked three more rounds up his back as he was running away. Ben got three of them. He, got, he shot one guy through the mouth. He 203'd two of them, didn't he? Yep. Because he hit like the tree in between them or something like air, bur air bursted the them. Dirt. And uh, yeah, boom, it was nice and loud. So out of the 11 that were there, um, we killed six, wounded five. That checkpoint that was right down the road from us got attacked, but the, the infantry guys, they were the QRF basically for it. You know, after they're doing their thing for a while, I'm like, all right, we're gonna come back. You know, in between there and getting back, they got hit hard. Yeah, and one of the trucks, they, um, an RPG hit the fuel tank was strapped to the back of it, burned the whole truck down. And I guess they had the Afghan police truck uh, in the very back of their convoy. The Afghan police truck got hit by an RPG. The amount of firepower, being on Highway 1, there's no cover. And when, that was a Mark 19 truck, and the, uh, the feed tray cover from that Mark 19 actually saved that gunner's life because he had flipped it up to, to reload and it bam, around. Yeah. yeah. I think it was three uh, Afghan police guys. They just ran straight to the, like straight at the ambush and just, sh just guns blazing. Like I talked to infantry people afterwards that were like, they think that those dudes may have saved lives. Those that we got that day were 4th Brigade, 10th Mountains, first confirmed combat kills. We thought we were going home in late July, early August, because we drove all the way down to Kandahar. Yes, and that's when we got the VVID, right? So it was a huge convoy down to Kandahar. We had like three jingle trucks per every one of our vehicles, pretty much. I was all the way in the back. I was, I was in Sergeant Camp's vehicle. I'm not sure that the commander was with us. Can we talk about this? Is this no, he got medevaced. He wasn't there. He got really sick. I remember that. He hurt himself. Yeah, he, uh, he fell over and gashed he, his head uh, open. Yeah. But I remember, yeah, going on down that highway, just driving down and... Just coming into the kind of suburbs of Kandahar. Mm -hmm. I was in the middle. I was in the front. <laughs> yeah, so I was, was you were probably the third or fourth Humvee. I think we had three jingle trucks in front of us. Then we had another Humvee and had a V-bid come in from the side and uh, go off on the Humvee in front of me, which would have been four vehicles in front of me. You can't be ready for anything like that. I mean, you, how do you prepare for something like that? Or are you just driving and it just poof? It was a 14 hour road trip. Yeah. Thankfully a poorly made uh, V-bed because it was just a lot of fuel. So it just made a huge fireball. It was loud. I mean, I, I was at the end of the convoy, so I was a mile or so behind you yeah. guys and we heard it. Yeah, it was, a, it was a Hollywood explosion. Yeah. <laughs> it was loud. One of the few exceptions where that was a good thing. Right. It was loud and lots of fire and nothing else. It started the back right tire on fire. I remember that. And I think the fuel, the fuel cans, cans on fire. <laughs> I was looking that. through pictures the other night. I realized I have pictures of his, of his it, the fuel cans are just liquid. <laughs> like, like dripping out of the rack. <laughs> All I remember, the, the aftermath, like the, the body, 
Was it, oh, just laying on the road, was that the driver? Was that the assumed? There was only one person in the vehicle. Right? It had to have been. It literally just, it like deposited him on the ground. Yes. And right away I remember like, you know, you start watching for an ambush, something, and there was nothing else. It was just the that was there. really weird, yeah, because normally they would hit an IED and then use it to initiate an ambush. And that would have been a good opportunity to do it because we were so spread out. Yeah, but nobody shot at us. Nobody at all, yeah. They had a lot of distance between them and the next truck, and they could have gotten messed up. And, uh, yeah, so just a big fireball and a burnt-out car, and everyone was fine. Geary, I think, got a scratch on his face. Yeah, he got a good flash burn on his yeah. face from it. Hey, he got he got up for Bart. Yeah, rolled the rest of the way into Kandahar. So we got to Kandahar, and then they tell us we're going back out. You know, I had forgotten all about that. Dude, yes. we, were, we were pissed. We got, yes, I remember we, we thought we were leaving. Yeah, and then we went to Kandahar for, I want to say like a we week. We were there for a week or two, because we did a complete reset. Yeah. I mean, we got attacked once at Kandahar. I think that was the one where, like, we heard the sirens go off. And then somebody came in the tent yelling at us because we hadn't gone to the bunkers. Oh, yes. <laughs> we were already pretty accustomed to it at that point. And then you get the fobbits, if you will, that are like trying to be hardcore and like enforce that. It's like, yeah. okay. Marshall just kind of put his head up because he's like listening for something. Fuck it. Just laid back down. We're like, oh, my spoiler said, fuck it. I'm laying down. Yeah. <laughs> Sergeant Doyle came in just screaming like, just, he was pissed because we, none of us had moved. We were just still, I was in the bunker waiting for all you. I had to get accountability. Because you hear them go over. Oh, if, you, yeah. if you can hear them, then they're missed. So. Yep. <laughs> Kandahar was where we caught people taking pictures of our vehicles because they hadn't seen, like, battle damage yeah. before. That was a completely blur to me. At that point, I became... Uh, the talk and see all, let's just put it that way. I, 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 don't, I didn't go out in missions anymore. And then you guys went out and built uh, Fob Warrior. Yeah, so that's, I wish I never got to, I never got to leave that Fob, which is a bummer. Yeah, we basically, we had to, a &O had to fill in all the HESCO baskets, sandbags. I had some uh, construction experience on the civilian side doing framing. Once they found out, they decided they wanted me to build all of our buildings. So I built the NWR, the chapel, the barbershop. I want to say about a couple of weeks in, they decided to break us all up and send us off with the different infantry companies. And An engineer squad got tasked out to each platoon to run route clearance in the front, which uh, a lot less sophisticated, but you know, still found a few. One of their convoys got hit by an IED, so you know, they decided just to go through the village they were in someone's almost like a little basement type thing. Like, oh, they think there's something there. So we had those little metal detectors they sent. They made me strip down just to my regular uniform, take my IBA off, go in here because it was full of hay. Swept the whole area, didn't find anything, and got back out, put my shit on, and I was just hay. Just like, it was a miserable day after that. I always remember, I know you have a picture of it, but that sticker, it was on my truck, I break for IEDs. I got those, I was yeah. the one who ordered those. Yeah, like I love that, <laughs> that one. We got so much crap for those. The people were taking pictures of our vehicles yeah. and like the motor pool. <laughs> I remember we put would put nicknames, because we were gone, we were bored. We put nicknames instead of our names. The pirate flag, I remember we had that pirate flag up forever. And we went up to Kandahar, ended up in Ghazni for a little bit, Gardez. That was just all on the road trip. The road up trip to up to Salerno. How many? How long did it take us to get up there? Like a week? It took so. I don't remember how long it took, but it took. It a was while. hot as hell. I remember that. Uh, like I remember not sleeping for days and just driving. I remember they did all that work to our trucks while we were in Kandahar, and then yes. like they immediately started breaking down again. I don't think we got out of Kandahar before we were towing one of the Humvees. That was a pretty high pucker factor drive, going through some of the mountain. We were the first Americans to go through there in a couple of years. Yeah, because anybody going from Salerno to Gardez or Ghazni, typically, yeah, they went by helicopter. I was maybe the rear truck. I was driving that night for some reason, and we had a tow bar attached to our, our bumper, and that tow bar jolted or whatever from a bump and knocked out one of the headlights. And whenever it knocked out one of the headlights, it caught it on fire and both the headlights went out. And I had to drive this long drive at night <laughs> with no headlights. I remember my eyeballs just hurting whenever oh I got God, done because yeah. like I had been straining so hard. 
we were at Salerno for like two weeks doing stuff. I don't remember what squad it was when we ended up in Pakistan by accident. Yeah. And we're looking at the Blue Force tracker like, bro, we are in the wrong country. I think I do remember that. Yeah, <laughs> I do. LT was freaking out like, no, we need to turn around now. <laughs> And then I don't remember why we got pulled back down, but we got pulled down to Fob Warrior. Yep, so that's and exactly. Yeah, so we went up to Salerno because I think it was a mission that we were being attached to the 101st headquarters that was up there. And then at that point, some reason, we ended up getting pulled back and we ended up building Fob Warrior at that point. It was being built when we were in Salerno because we got back down and it was pretty much already done. And then we started doing four days out, two days back. Okay. <laughs> for the rest of the deployment, basically. Okay, okay. The QRF and all that yeah. stuff. That was the scariest driving I've ever done. I mean, I remember just driving because I was always a driver on through these mountain passes that weren't as wide as my Humvee. We ended up on that OP for like four days. Yep. We were just camped up there on that ridge line. Yep. I remember leaving that was that really sketchy like hill traverse that we had to do. Oh. But we had the gunners drop down because we were worried the vehicles were going to yes. roll over. Yep. And we're like crabbing sideways across. This Literally. Thing. My truck was lead truck because I was uh, Alan's gunner at the time. Yeah. I'm glad that that dude knew where he was going and could read a map and stuff because I literally couldn't see my hand in front of my face. <laughs> Using the blue force tracker to keep us going the right direction and like literally the touch and feel method of like the vehicle would go off the side of the road and you'd like swerve back we up. I think we were on highway one, but we were in a sandstorm. And so you can't see past like the barbed wire roll that's on the hood. People were falling asleep driving and just running into things. It was just open oh, yeah. desert. Afghanistan uh, all in all is just kind of a big blur of a lack of sleep and it's just, yeah. We were so busy. <laughs> it was all the time. Man. That was probably why I was driving, was because yeah. somebody was falling asleep. And I remember, like, uh, Wody or James, he fell into a literal hole. I mean, it was like his truck, I don't know how we got it out of there. I mean, we were just all so tired. You got the best case of food poisoning I ever treated. Yep, it was, we just started this. It was QRF for the Vigilant Archer guys. Yeah, I mean, it they was... got into contact, and we, all, we went hauling ass out there. <laughs> yeah, and it was like an 18-hour mission. We were clearing clearing buildings and I remember I mean 30 minutes in we just we were staging and I had a pair and 30 minutes later I started throwing up and it didn't stop I just remember tightening my seatbelt and popping a Humvee door open and just you were throwing up every 30 minutes for like the next 14 hours I was just chugging water just to throw up something because the dry heaving was just I had you plugged into an IV sitting in the back seat like I just needed like yeah anti-nausea medicine and to lay down I mean, yeah. that's all I wanted to do, and I couldn't. You were just straight up in 90 You wanted years. to die, is what you dying wanted to would do. Be pr dying was my favorite option. <laughs> it was that bad. You want to talk about that one day at all? The At the cache? Yeah. yeah, go for it. Oh, that was the day I jacked up my pinky. So when we left that morning, it was still dark. Uh, you remember that? Yeah, that was a long day. Pulled my charging handle back, it gets stuck. All of a sudden, I don't know what I did, but it slams forward. I think I remember that because I think I actually like wrapped it up a little bit he may while have, we were out because there. It was, yeah, because it was bleeding pretty good, so you may have. <laughs> so that was a good start to the mission. <laughs> and we were out there for, because we checked multiple villages. Yeah, because we were looking for like a high value target, I'm pretty sure. That was the original mission because we were like going to assault that. Like yeah. we, were, we were assaulting the village. Like that was the whole goal. We just didn't find anyone in there. And then somebody in one of the one of the compounds told us yeah. about the cache. Yeah. Somebody dropped down into one of those holes and came back up white as a fucking ghost. I was like, you gotta see this shit. I didn't go down like into the wadi. Yeah. I was up on top of it. It was me, Cardone, and Ferg. I think we're the only ones who really got down in there. And then we had the conversation of like, okay, who's gonna go down there and get all this crap? I was in my gunner's turret. I was a gun I was a gunner that day. Yeah. Um so I was just chilling in the security. turret, yeah, pulling security. We were there for a good two, three hours. Once we it found took the cache, us, yeah, it took a long time. I remember just being bored. So I'm sure bored. you were. <laughs> because I was just it was stressful security, as you know? hell for Cardone and I because oh, sure. he he told me we were down there, he's like, if you hear me curse or yell, get the fuck out of my way because I'm coming out of this hole. It means I just you know, set some form of booby trap off and I'm trying to get out of here. I was watching um, as you guys were pulling and stacking stuff for the engineers to... to Blow up. Yeah. 
I heard from in the distance though, and uh, boom. And then, you know, I immediately looked, looked past to see where it had come from. And I saw, you know, about a, probably about a mile away, these two knuckleheads on top of a little hill. I was turning and I didn't catch fully. I was still turning my head while it hit. Oh yeah, I was but facing I mean, it. I still didn't see it when it happened. Because I think that Stacy was to my left. Because he was like the first one, I think, to shoot back, actually. Probably. I mean, um, because it was like remember. right there. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like right there in front of him. You ever pick up one of those? I just handled 120 oh, of them. Yeah, we, we did find a <laughs> bunch of them that day. I forgot what all I was in there. I just handed a whole fucking stack of them out to uh, Ferguson. How big, how big was that cache? Um, it was over. It was right around 100. Because you would have been looking the other way, right? So it went off like behind you. It was kind of, I want to say it was kind of to my like back left. Yeah. Yeah. I was probably about 50 meters away from it. I was like 15. Yeah. <laughs> I was close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> several of you guys were closer to Yeah. The there was a bunch of us that were real close. Moved the truck just a little bit to get in a better position to try to shoot back. Well, and like I told you, I didn't even know that we were getting shot at in addition to that. Yeah. Because my ears were ringing so bad after the first round came in, I had no idea that they had continued shooting at us. I just ran and piled into Vold's truck. Yeah. Stacy was my gunner. He immediately just took off, jumped on the on the truck, and we had a Mark 19. Wow. Boom, 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 boom. But yeah, you guys were all shooting back. The infantry guys were shooting at somebody else because they started getting engaged from the town side and then blew the cache up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty big boom. That was a good mushroom cloud. Yeah. It's a rather intense personal experience when somebody shoots at you. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird. It was like everything slowed down. You know, I was wired for several hours after that and then that night after you know, I got in my cot and was bedding down, all of a sudden the light went out. Dude, you crash yeah. so hard. <laughs> I say out of everything I did in my military career, that was the greatest feeling of accomplishment I have ever had professionally, where you know, I led men in battle. Yeah. We killed and wounded enemy. They didn't touch us. I remember we had, uh, we did one, um, it was a village medical outreach. Yeah, and the ANP quit on that one because one of their idiots shot himself, one of his toes. Yep. <laughs> and then they tried to blame it on us. Yeah. It's like, no, um, your uh, AK-74 there fires 5.45 millimeter rounds, smaller than our 5.56. It was a perfect hole. It didn't even touch the sides of his toe. Yeah. Like that was what was crazy. Yeah. I mean, if it would have been one of our M4s that shot him, it would have, taken would have been a bigger hole. They started circling up on us, and then all you guys circled up on them. Yeah. That wasn't going to work out well for them. No. They figured that out real quick. But the LT, me, and the Terp ended up in the middle of the circle. One of you guys just, like, tapped me on the back. <laughs> it was like... Hey, Doc, back up a little. And I realized the only person who didn't have any coverage on him was the police chief. So I just, I unsnapped my holster. I was like, all right, you're mine, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> they grabbed all their dudes and ran off. The back half of the deployment was pretty chill. I think the biggest Stu thing I have, Stu got blown up. We hit a small IED. But that was like, that was the biggest part of that part of the deployment. And then we got the word that we were heading back. Like, they had started the leave for some people to go back. See, now I left out earlier than you guys. You guys got home in November. Yeah. And I had ended up taking leave in October. I ended up reporting back to Polk at that point instead yeah. of going back to country. Because we ended up in um, Bagram for nearly an entire month on the way back. Like just, just waiting to leave and customs. And all. That was when they sent 2nd Platoon out yeah, to finish up 2.30 to finish basically the winter. I'm glad we didn't have to go through the winter because... Oh, I heard their stories. Oh, second platoon was miserable. So, yeah, and then we changed places in November. Yeah, you met us in Bagram because we saw yeah, you. I saw right. all you guys. That's right. So you got to 2.30 and then deployed basically later that year. Yeah, only for four months. And only over the winter. <laughs> we were bringing you guys back so y'all could get enough dwell time 
and then that we would go and have a short enough deployment so we would have dwell time for us all to go to Iraq the next year as a larger unit. But your threat in Afghanistan was very different than Iraq too because it was all anti-tank mines. Yeah, I mean, you were mines. There was very little, I mean, we didn't see any little to no bombs, I mean, going off uh, in Afghanistan. The Afghanistan trip for us was so cold and so much snow for a month of it anyhow, a month of the three and a half or something that we might have been there that we didn't, I mean, donkeys couldn't move. I got there in, uh, in November, before Thanksgiving, the beginning of November, uh, right as the first snow fell. I, I was there when the first snow fell. It was kind of chill, really. Like, it was a mud hut. It was, it was starting to snow. There wasn't as much fighting because it was winter. Well, Afghanistan has uh, fighting season. Yeah, it was literally their off season for fighting. And it was, it was more of a humanitarian mission than Iraq was. So even though we were a treatment team, we didn't just, like, stay in a tent the whole time. Like, we did the, uh, what we call them, VMO, village medical outreaches, where we would bring uh, rice and, you know, all this stuff and bring it out to these villages. Trying to keep trucks from gelling. Oh, uh, latrines from freezing. I thought I was going to a desert. And when we got there, like Colorado or something, kind you of. know, like Rocky Mountains. It reminds me a lot of Nevada. You, yeah, like where there's desert plains and then snow-capped mountains. And what were you doing for that deployment? Were you an aid station medic? I was, yeah, I was in the aid station. Four months, five months of a, we were back you out were of back there. back by February. It was a typical deployment, I, I guess, if, if you can say anything about something like that being normal. What did I think, of, why do I think about that deployment? Man, there was just so much about that deployment that I, it was just such a fun adventure just being a young kid with my buddies just cruising around this country. The, the lack of education was so prevalent that, you know, you couldn't even describe where you were from. Like, you know, I'm from across the ocean. What's an ocean? I can tell you it was good. I can tell you it was bad all in the same sentence. It's the best times in your life and it's the worst times of your life and they're rubbing shoulders. Yes, exactly. Being in the group, just the camaraderie and stuff. Oh yeah, it was like it sucked there, but you, you were sucking together. We all just had that like, uh, yeah, well. The, the, the things that I remember the most are the people that I was there with. The living conditions were awful. Awful. But the day-to-day -day stuff was actually quite a bit of fun. Yeah, we all had real good morale. I mean, we all just were like, okay, this is what we're doing and we made the best of it. We just did our jobs. We did what we were supposed to be doing. I wish so much I could go back as a tourist. Oh, I've said that so many times. Some of it was really great, yeah. If I met you outside of the army, most of these people would be people that I would never hang out with. In the army, that's the beauty of it. You, you're wearing the same uniform. You're all the same, we're all equal. Well, just look at our headquarters section for that deployment. Yes. We had Sergeant Thornburg, from Saipan. Saipan. Yes. Ellie's Ellie. from Guam. Guam. Uh, I'm from Bolivia. I'm from the mountains of Colorado. Yes. I completely enjoyed it. I mean, I think there was tough moments, but I thought we we all came back, you know, how we left. I can honestly say I'm, I'll do it again with the same group of people. I don't remember much from traveling back. I don't remember anything from I think that. some of it was we were just also jet lagged. <laughs> we went right back into training. Yeah.